living in with my dad after my mom died was like a walk through a forest. At first glance, you feel akin to your surroundings. Then you take a closer look down below around your feet, up over your head, and deep into your heart. There, you discover little secrets, those quiet, spectacular moments of love. My father was born on December 12, 1922, to Lyle and Ursula Johnson. They lived on a farm in Le Grand, Iowa. He was the first of three boys and a girl. These are facts easily known about any person with a birth certificate. I've known my father all my life, but until I lived with him again recently, I really didn't know him. He kept all kinds of little secrets. He wanted to keep the secrets to himself, or maybe he just didn't have the time, or just wasn't the right moment to share them. Of course, I lived with my father as a child until I was almost 18 when I left home, but that's different. When my mother died, my father was alone in the house for the first time after 68 years of marriage. At the time, I'd recently divorced after 30 years of marriage. Like my dad, I was living alone. But in my case, it was by choice. One afternoon, I asked him how he was doing. He said, when I can't make it up and down the stairs to do the laundry, I'll have to sell the house. Well, I can go up and down the stairs, I said. I can come here. I can live with you, and we'll figure this out together. So after living in my house for only a year, I left. I moved in with my dad. Our agreement was for me to live with him for one year, and by the end of that year, we would have a plan for him. It was a sacred time with him, the time we spent together. I really got to know my father with a subtlety and a depth I think few people have the privilege to. This is when I discovered all these little secrets about my father. He eats seven prunes for breakfast, eight at noon, and four at dinner time to keep himself regular. He doesn't listen to the radio or any music, except for special occasions. When he works, his mind is enough. I wonder what goes on inside. According to the Milenkovich theory, there should have been no deglaciation at all. We measured the time 135, 136,000 years ago. He uses the same keyboard he's had for the past who knows how many years. The ink's worn off the keys. But adjusting to a new keyboard would be difficult because of his rheumatoid arthritis. He goes to bed early, about 9 o'clock. He wakes up a few hours later to pee and does 42 laps around the living room and kitchen and then he sleeps until morning. Nice. He loves his zinnias. I gave him the seeds from my garden and he wishes He'd known about them years ago. He raises monarchs from tiny eggs to little caterpillars to big caterpillars to chrysalises to butterflies.
He's done this since peanut butter came in glass jars. Well, this I knew before I lived with my dad. But when a caterpillar dies from some fungus, bacteria, a virus, or some genetic defect that keeps it from developing any further, his heart gives a little squeeze. I knew my father had a birth defect. When I was five or six, he took us kids to the open swim at the junior high pool. We paid a quarter to get in. I loved the water, but I wasn't a very good swimmer. So he taught me how to float on my back first, because if I were in trouble, I could stay afloat that way and survive for quite a while. As you can guess, I knew from a very young age of my father's birth defect. When he swam, it was the only time his chest was bare. He was a muscular man, all but for the right side of his chest. There, he had a significant concave void. And as it turned out, it was not so simple. He told me about when he was born. His grandfather, the town doctor, told his mother, this baby will never survive. My father was missing four or five ribs. On only skin between the outside and the lungs. Two or three more ribs were just stumps. One of several reasons for the army not taking me. The tips of his clavicles crisscrossed below his Adam's apple. Well, but you can't see one of them. One of them is kind of buried behind the other. The right side of his lower jaw protruded, and his right hip socket was misaligned. The entire right side of his skeleton had one deformity or another, and who knew what deformities lingered inside his rib cage? But my father lived with this has lived with this his entire life. He knows no other way of being. He told me a story about going swimming with a bunch of boys in Davidson Creek, where it pours into the Iowa River. He was four or five years old. His mother said for the first and only time, Robert, keep your shirt on. And she didn't have to explain. He knew by the look on her face and the tone in her voice that he needed to be ashamed of his deformity. My father told me another story. When he was of courting age, before he left home to go to college in Des Moines, his mother made him a pad. With elastic straps, he could slip the pad into the bowl of his chest. It was like a firm but soft pillow. So when he hugged a woman, he would be whole. At the age of 25, he met my mother, a high school senior on a blind date. He wore this pad so she would assume he was whole. And at a certain point, of course, he had to reveal his shame but contrary to other women he dated, it didn't matter to her. She loved him so much. So when I lived with my father, he shared a few secrets with me. I learned how much he loved my mother. I learned how much he loved me. I learned how much he felt for anyone who struggled with circumstances beyond their control. Like Leo, his grandson, with Down syndrome. Or a monarch caterpillar's unexpected demise. Eight months into living with my father, I had to face the fact that I'd be leaving in a few months and someone needed to take my place. I had a house. I was in a serious relationship.
The day that broke my heart was the day I sent this letter. Seeking live-in companion for my father in exchange for room and board. Bob is a retired Honeywell physicist and adjunct University of Minnesota professor of paleoclimatology. He's an intellectually and physically active elderly gentleman living in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Move in as early as August or as late as January for at least one year. A little background. Since my mother's death in October, I've been living with my dad for a transitional year. He's doing very well, still writing, researching, tending the garden, and laughing even in these unusual political times. However, our time together will end soon. We've explored many ideas on what phase two might look like. So if you are interested, that looks pretty good. let's talk. I'll feel much better knowing we've planned ahead. But when the time comes, I'll be sorry to leave his everyday companionship. Ooh, it's cold. Here. <laughs> Wear that inside. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you.